Okay, hello everyone and thank you for logging in. My name is Michael Downey and as host of today's session, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first AWRI webinar for the 2017-18 series. This week's session explores a new alternative heat test, which offers same day results without compromising accuracy. And it's a fantastic topic to kick off the series and one that's generated a lot of interest. Uh, to tell us more about this new research, we're fortunate to have with us Jackie McRae, a research scientist with the AWRI. Now, Jackie attained her PhD in natural products chemistry from Swinburne University, Melbourne in 2008, after completing a degree in chemistry with first class honours in biotech. Since joining the AWRI in 2009, she has investigated red wine tannins and astringency matrix effects on white wine haze formation and better ways of predicting heat stability. But before I hand over to Jackie to get us started, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. For attendees that have joined an AWRI previously, you may have noticed that the AWRI is using a new platform to host webinars called Zoom. For attendees, functionality should be very similar. If you'd like to join the conversation, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send please feel free to send through your questions at any stage. And once we get to the Q&A, Jackie will address them. And if you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. Now, before we begin, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. Okay, that's enough from me for now. I'm going to hand over to Jackie to get us started. Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar. Um, today I wanted to talk a bit about the work that I've done with respect to predicting heat stability of wine and in particular I want to look at that tried and true method of the heat test to see if we can better predict wine and bentonite dose, maybe make it a little bit more reproducible and particularly maybe make it a bit shorter without compromising accuracy. So this is some of the work that I've been doing over the last few years. So the heat test is beautiful in its simplicity. It's a fantastic method. So it involves just heating up the wine, cooling it down, and then measuring the amount of turbidity that's been produced before and after heating. So the idea behind that is if there are proteins that are present in the wine that will produce a haze or potentially produce a haze later on, uh, this method will throw a haze immediately. So then you can use that to work out how much bentonite you need to add to stop that haze from forming. So this method is decades old. It's used right around the world and there's many variations of the method um, in the industry at the moment. So the one that's most commonly used in the uh, Australian wine industry since about the 1970s is um, where the wine is heated at 80 degrees for six hours and then cooled at four degrees for 16 hours. So effectively just put in the fridge overnight. So this has been a really good method. It, it was used um, oh, since 1973. And the problem with it though, it's got a 24 hour turnaround time. And there were some questions that said, maybe this is leading to overfining. Maybe these conditions aren't uh, accurate in terms of reality and what will, the wine will go through. So this was revisited again by Ken Pocock who created the original method. This was revisited in 2006. And he had another look at it and said, well, maybe six hours is, is potentially a bit too long. Maybe just make that two hours. So it's brought that back down for the heating at two hours, but it still has that overnight cooling step. So the total turnaround time now is looking like around about 20 hours. Now, a few years ago, when I was looking at this method, there was a lot of interest around the heat test. And the reason for that is because now we know a lot more about the proteins that produce this haze. 
So we know that they will instantly unfold when they get to about 65 degrees. So 55 to 65 degrees, they're going to instantly unfold. So maybe 80 degree heating, maybe that's a little bit too high. So we want to have a bit of a look at that. The other thing is two hours. So if these proteins are instantly unfolding when they get to 65 degrees, maybe it doesn't need two hours. Maybe we can drop that back a little bit as well. And one of the areas that I was particularly interested in addressing is this overnight cooling step, because that is really the rate determining step for the whole method. Does it need to be cooled overnight at four degrees? And does cooling time matter? So this is something that I was um, interested in looking at. So first up with some results, um, changing the heating time has an enormous impact on the amount of haze produced. So particularly you can see there in that first, say, hour and a half, once it comes to temperature, the amount of haze increase is enormous. So just over that hour and a half is uh, several magnitudes of haze formation greater than just in that first 30 minutes. Now compare that to from two hours to six hours. So there is still an increase in haze, but it's a much smaller increase in haze over those four hours than it is over that initial hour and a half. So judging on these results, I wouldn't want to reduce the haze anything more than two hours. So very happy to keep that at two hours minimum for, for heating. Now with respect to temperature, uh, I'd be less inclined to change the temperature. And the only reason for that is because water bars are just not that accurate. So if you have a water bath set to 80 degrees, that could realistically fluctuate between 70 and 90 degrees. So plus or minus 10 degrees is what we're looking at for, for most water baths, so most um, standard water baths. So if you have a water bath set at, for example, 70 degrees, and if that drops down to 60 degrees, which is below that um, instant protein unfolding temperature, then maybe, maybe that's starting to mess with the results a little bit. But if you have a water bath set for 80 degrees and it drops down to 70, that's still above that 65 degrees. So probably it's still fine. So leave the, the heating time at two hours, leave the heating temperature at 80 degrees. Wouldn't want to change that. Now, the other results that I was looking at is with cooling time and temperature. So here's some results um, composite from a few wines. This is after heating at 80 degrees for two hours and then cooling at different amounts of time. So I've taken these samples and measured them. Um, it was every hour for five hours. It was actually a half hour in the middle there as well. Haze definitely increases with cooling time. Um, particularly in that first hour, you get an enormous amount of haze formed. It tends to level out a little bit between one and two hours, and then um, more or less stable after that, depending on the wine. But based on these results, I'd say cooling um, needs to be a minimum of two hours, and I'd recommend three hours, just because you're getting a lot of variation in the wines. So definitely cooling time has an enormous impact on the amount of haze that is produced in the heat test. So um, heating time's really good, keep that stable, but also keep the cooling time stable. So the other area that I was looking at is the cooling temperature. So cooling temperature, I've got some results here just for comparison. So these are four different wines. Uh, heating at, again, um, 80 degrees for two hours, and then cooling at uh, 20 degrees for three hours. So this is in a water bath maintaining the temperature at 20 degrees. So variations in the haze that's produced there. And if we compare that to zero degrees, so this is plunging it straight from the water bath that's at 80 degrees, plunging it straight into an ice bath. So zero degrees, held there for two hours and then brought back up to room temperature for another hour. So the same amount of time but different temperatures. And depending on the wines, there is a, either a really big result, a really big difference in the amount of haze produced, or it can be a bit similar. So it really does depend on the wine. And this comes back to the wines having so much variation in the matrix composition. So certainly with some of these wines, having the uh, water bath um, at zero, so an ice bath, compared to 20 degrees, is having a huge impact. 
But to compare this again to cooling temperature and time, so if we look at the method uh, from Ken Pocock in 2006, so this is two hours of heating um, and then followed by overnight cooling. So overnight cooling, four degrees for 16 hours and then bringing that back up to room temperature before remeasuring. So generally speaking, that extra time is leading to more haze being produced. Just with wine one being a little bit strange there, showing that there is so much variation in um, different wines. But generally speaking, if you've left it for a longer amount of time, you're going to get more haze. So we've shown heat time and temperature matters, cooling time and temperature matters, but really what does this all mean? Does this mean that we're predicting haze better? Does it mean that um, one of these methods is overfining while the other is showing a more accurate result? Uh, this is something that I really wanted to look at. Like this is really, really critical. So I've looked at this in three different stages. And the first stage, just straight up, I've got some numbers. I want to see if my numbers match current standards. So current standard measures of heat test, how does the shorter heat test compare? So I've got some comparisons here for you. These are the three wines that um, made up that composite graph that I showed earlier. And these, this is the um, amount of haze produced after heating for two hours at 80 degrees. So we're seeing that same uh, change in haze with cooling time, like what we saw earlier. So wine one, wine two is slightly different. It's really taking that um, two hours, maybe three hours to stabilise. Whereas wine three, for instance, it gets, gets to amount of haze after one hour of cooling and then just kind of just stays there. So that's, that one's a little bit different as well. So these are my numbers. Now, if I compare that to the commercial services results, and this is a time where I'm um, stalking the commercial services people and getting really excited every time somebody has a wine that's failed. And I know this is really bad news for the wineries involved probably, but I'm getting really excited because I can measure my heat test method. Um, so these are, these are the comparisons that I've made from that. So the commercial services results, so this is heating for six hours at 80 degrees and cooling for 20 minutes at 20 degrees. So you can see from this first one, the wine one, that um, after two hours of heating and then two hours of cooling, you're getting numbers that are higher than those from commercial services. So this is showing that these, these numbers are actually meaningful and they're giving something that is um, a reasonable representation of the haze produced from a standard method. So wine two, again, two hours of heating is giving very similar numbers to the commercial services results. Now, this is one of the wines where I was starting to get a little bit nervous about the two hour cooling just because it's a little bit lower. And I wanted to make sure that these numbers are coming in at above what's coming uh, from commercial services. So this is where three hours of cooling is really showing that it, it can be important. So with, with wine three, completely different again, it's much, much lower. So uh, the commercial services re result. So after one hour cooling, um, this is getting a higher haze than the 20 minutes cooling after six hours of heating. So cooling time is really, really important. Now, the other thing just for comparison, um, just wanted to show you as well, is the um, one hour heating. So one hour heating is producing much less haze than two hours of heating. And this is after two hours of cooling. And this didn't really change. It doesn't go up much after two hours of cooling. So this is why I've chosen two hours cooling just to show you here. But certainly one hour cooling, it's much lower haze, um, uh, much less confident in those results. So two hours of cooling, uh, sorry, two hours of heating uh, minimum and then three hours of cooling. Um, is, is still showing some really good results. So that's stage one. Stage one, comparing with current standards, and this is something I recommend people do if they're thinking about this method as well. This is ongoing work. So every time we're getting some samples into commercial services, uh, we're doing this comparative test as well. Uh, so comparing with current standards is stage one. Stage two, 
is to look at bentonite additions. So we're seeing differences in haze, which is really interesting and really, really important as well. But what does this mean when we want to look at this with respect to how much bentonite needs to be added? Are we going to be over finding wines or under finding wines? How does this relate to the amount of bentonite we need to add? And the reason that this really, really matters is because a bentonite concentration doesn't necessarily relate to the amount of haze that's originally present in the wines. So I've got some examples here. Um, this is a spread from some of the wines that uh, we were trialling earlier on. So, for instance, the Chardonnay down around, it's right on 2 or 2.1. It's very, very close to 2. And uh, these other wines here, like Sauv Blanc or, um, oh, that's not Sauv Blanc, a Riesling or um, Vermentino, these are up around 20. So very big spread in the amount of haze that's produced by these wines. Whereas they all have the same bentonite requirement. So same 0.2 grams per litre to get that below uh, change in NTU of two. So even though these wines are very, very different in with respect to the amount of haze that they're producing early on, the bentonite requirements are the same. So the other thing that's really, really interesting here is that you have two wines, they have exactly the same haze rating, but they require almost double bentonite for that Viognier compared to um, the, the um, which one's that? A Pinot Grigio. Um, so very, very similar um, haze to start with and very different uh, bentonite requirements. So this is why we really need to look at the bentonite additions with respect to that haze that we've produced, um, which is varying. So these are the trials that I was looking at. So um, com to compare the bentonite additions, I wanted to look at the original heat test method, which is six hours at 80 degrees, followed by overnight cooling. Also looked at the modified method, so two hours at 80 degrees with overnight cooling. And I wanted to see if the differences in um, cooling temperature also mattered. So we've got the two hours at zero degrees, and this is followed by another hour to get that back to room temperature. So three hours cooling and the three hours at 20 degrees. So these are the four methods that I was looking at. And as always with the heat test, um, always look to filter these wines, filter your wines before doing the heat test, preferably 0.45. And the reason for that is that there, if there are any particles present in the wine before you do the heat test, it's more likely to seed aggregation. So you may see some aggregation forming and maybe there wouldn't be as much. So it may seed aggregation. Also, I just want to note that the difference in NTU that I'm looking at for stability here is is two. So a change in NTU before and after heating of two. Some people will use 0.5, some people use one, and I'm going with two for these uh, tests just because that's what the original method was looking at. So less than two NTU. And this is also heating and cooling in a water bath, um, just for reference. Now with the results of these trials, so I want to show you first the Sauv Blanc. Now the first thing that I was particularly interested in is that the, the cooling time after two hours of heating, even though we're getting very, very different haze results, this is not translating into differences in bentonite dose rate. So this is a really promising result, which means that the um, cooling at, on the bench for three hours or, or in a room temperature water bath, for instance, for three hours is giving the same bentonite dose rate as cooling overnight. So this has shortened um, the heat test significantly. But one thing I did want to flag as well is that the six hour heat test, so heating for six hours, cooling overnight, gives higher results. A higher amount of bentonite is predicted to stabilise that wine compared with the two hour heat test. So the Sauvignon Blanc I wanted to show first just because this is the biggest difference in bentonite dose that I saw out of all these wines. So a difference of 0.3 grams per litre bentonite, which is really quite substantial. Now another one is uh, Pinot Gris, not Grigio, sorry, Pinot Gris. And this is, um, again, there's no difference in the cooling time or having an effect on the bentonite dose rate, but there is a difference from um, the six hour heat test to the two hour heat test. And this is 0.2 difference. And this is usually what I've seen for a lot of these wines coming through, that there is this 0.2 difference in um, bentonite dose, 0.2 grams per litre 
The Semillon Saint Blanc was really, really interesting because there's, there's no difference. And there was a couple of these wines that I've looked at where there is no difference in bentonite dose compared to six hour heat test and the two hour heat test. There's just no difference. So that was a really interesting result as well. And one that I did um, want to flag because it was um, particularly critical is the Chardonnay. So the Chardonnay did fail the six hour heat test and it passed the two hour heat test. So these results, um, just showing the, the range of, of bentonite additions and the effect of cooling time and heating time on um, the bentonite dose rates. So these results um, are really, really interesting in that there is no difference in the cooling time having that effect on the bentonite addition. So I was very happy about that. One thing that is of particular interest is that when we think about bentonite and the amount of bentonite we need to add, we tend to think about the amount of protein in the wine. So maybe wines with more protein, they need a lot more bentonite. And if you look at this table, these are um, the results for the eight wines that I was looking at. The lowest amount of protein needed the lowest amount of bentonite. This was beautiful. The wine with the highest amount of protein also needed the highest amount of bentonite. This is fantastic. But if we look in the middle there, we've got a range from about 60 milligrams per litre protein all the way up to 143 milligrams per litre protein, and they have the same bentonite dose rate. And that is a very big difference in the um, concentration of protein there. So it doesn't necessarily relate to the amount of protein. Um, the other one is always an interesting one is Sauvignon Blanc. This is kind of um, the most difficult wine with respect to haze. And this is throwing the whole thing out again. So um, say it's around roughly the same uh, protein concentration as the Pinot Gris, but it requires double the amount of bentonite to uh, stabilise it. And uh, this has got a lot more to do with the haze, um, with the wine matrix as well as protein. So it's just showing that um, protein and haze, they, they are correlated, that, but there's so many other factors that will influence haze and can influence bentonite uh, interactions as well. So there's a lot going on there. Now, so this is stage two. This is comparing the bentonite additions, which provides really useful results, but that's really not enough either. So we know that um, bentonite prediction using a six hour heat test is going to be more bentonite than using a two hour heat test for most wines. But does that mean that the six hour heat test is over, over fining? Does that mean that the two hour heat test is under fining? This is something we've really, really needed to know. And this is one of the critical parts of this trial, which is the long-term storage. So we really need to put these wines away and see if they are actually going to form a haze. And th these are the results. These are the really new results. I've only had these for about a month now. Um, so it's really fresh results. But um, when we come to looking at the, the storage, one of the critical questions is how long is long enough? Like how long do we need to store these wines for to get the answers that we're looking for? So looking back on the original heat test and also the revised heat test, how did they measure these wines? This is really a, a critical step. So do we look at it for 35 degrees for a month? Is that a representative way of measuring these wines? Do we look at best practice, which is cellar conditions for maybe 16 months? Or do we do a fluctuating, do we like, like a, a car boot trial, if you will, goes up to 35 degrees, goes down to 20 degrees, and this sort of fluctuation for eight days, is that something that's going to show us what we need to know with respect to how much haze is produced? So what we've settled for in the end, we've looked at 12 months, we're holding it at 17 degrees, so ideal conditions and also holding it at 28 degrees. So 28 degrees for 12 months, quite harsh, harsh conditions. So these are the results from that trial. Firstly, um, after 12 months, most of the control wines were going hazy, not all of them. But um, if we're looking at a haze ranking of two, so I've measured the turbidity in these wines after 12 months. So after, at um, 17 degrees, four of them have gone hazy. Um, and at uh, 28 degrees, uh, five of them have gone hazy. Now there's a couple there that I wanted to flag 
Firstly, that Chardonnay is still stable. Even at 28 degrees, that Chardonnay is not showing a haze. So maybe the six hour heat test that said it need, needed to be fined, maybe that is over fining. The other thing I wanted to flag, just because it's an incredibly strange result, is the uh, Riesling. This Riesling at 17 degrees is failing the heat test, uh, sorry, fa failing haze. It's definitely showing a haze. And this is after storage at 17 degrees. Weird, because at 28 degrees, it's not failing. So um, not sure if that's to do with variation in the wine, in the handling, not not sure, but it is a strange result. So after 12 months, these are the wines that are going hazy. Now, in terms of the fined wines, if we look after 17, at 17 degrees for 12 months, uh, the wines that are fined at the rate of six hours heating and overnight cooling are similar in turbidity as the wines that are heated for two hours and cooled at uh, 20 degrees for three hours. So they're showing a similar turbidity. The one thing I did want to flag out of these eight wines, one of them failed and that was that Riesling. It failed again and it only failed from the six hour heat test and that's after storage at 17 degrees. So bizarre. But just wanted to flag that that, well, that one wine did fail. Now the other wine, wines at 28 degrees, at 28 degrees we do see the haze is increasing, so the amount of turbidity that's showing in these wines is increasing compared to at 17 degrees, but it's still well below the 2 NTU. Uh, this is really, really positive because 28 degrees, quite harsh conditions and even fining um, at the rate predicted, that lower rate predicted by the two hour heat test is um, still coming in at, at, at being clear and bright. Now, again, there is one wine that failed. This failed, um, this was a Viognier that failed. Um, and again, we don't know if that's to do with the wine itself or to do with the conditions of handling. So one wine out of the seven did fail. So I just wanted to flag that. But these results are really, really promising. And uh, looking again at the heat test, so um, compared to the original method and the revised method, I think it makes a case for doing the heat test for 80 degrees at two hours and then cooling at um, 20 degrees for three hours. So you can really get the heat test down to within one day. And these results are looking really reproducible. Uh, Long-term storage trials look pretty good. Um, and comparing to the commercial services results, so a standard method, they are also looking pretty good. But I'd recommend doing your own in-house measurements just to make sure that you're happy with it if you want to go forward with that. So just in summary, um, so the heat test, certainly filter your wines, I'd recommend doing that. Heating at 80 degrees for two hours in a water bath, if you can, is preferable. Um, in an oven, if you can't and then cooling three hours, preferably in water. So if you've got a, a, a bucket, for instance, something that can hold that temperature um, a little bit better than say on the bench. So maybe just running some tap water um, into a bucket and a, a sizable container that can um, maintain that heat for um, the three hours of the cooling. So this is looking really good for maintaining clear and bright wines that are less than two NTU. And now going forward, this is still being validated um, with the commercial services. So what we'll have on offer at uh, some stage when they've finished the validation is to have a new heat test, which is the two hours at 80 degrees and three hours cooling at 20 degrees. They will still have the old heat test if that's something that you prefer as well. Um, so, so you will have the options there. The other thing that we'll look at, which is really interesting discussions that I've had recently, is on rosé. And rosé seems to be a bit difficult with the bench night finding. I suspect that's because you have competing interests for the protein between tannins and between the bench night. I think that's what's going on there, but we need to explore that further. And also looking at um, the heat test on red wines and what that means for the results. Uh, also, how long till a protein unstable wine goes hazy? So if it fails the heat test, what does that mean really? Does that mean it's going to go hazy in a week or a month or a year and under what conditions? Um, and one thing I will say is that the uh, haze produced by the heat test 
has a different mechanism of haze formation than the haze produced at room temperature. It is different. So we really need to look at what this means in reality. And always, this is just to make sure that we, our, our white wines remain clear and bright and that you don't have any haze issues. So just in summary, I just want to um, acknowledge Wine Australia for funding and also really want to acknowledge um, the team here at um, Australian Wine Research Institute, in particular Ken Pocock, who developed the original heat test method and has been my, my mentor while I've been developing this new one. Uh, also Victor Barraclo, who was a travelling student. He came for a couple of months and spent the entire time on bench night finding trials and heat tests, which I'm sure he loved dearly. I'm sure he got a lot out of that. And just finally, I really want to acknowledge um, our industry partners because without their support we really can't do these trials. So a, a very big thank you to Alana from Yolumba, Wayne from Kingston Estate, Don Young at Pena Ricard Winemakers and also Sarah from Treasury Wine Estates and Warren at Accolade Wine. So they've provided a, a lot of wines um, during the busiest time of the year so we very much appreciate that. And uh, like I say, we won't have these sorts of results without the, um, our industry partners. So thank you very, very much for your attention. And I look forward to any questions you might have. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that, Jackie. Um, as Jackie's just indicated, uh, we are opening it up now to questions. So if you do have any questions for Jackie, she's gonna stick around and answer answer those questions. So start sending them through now. Just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, just click on the Q&A part of the webinar and type your question in. Um, already got a couple of questions here. Jackie, um, the first came early in the session. Um, it was just a question as to whether an NTU result of two is still considered heat stable. Um, I assume that that is still the case. Let me just unmute you, Jackie. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, from my experience and from the work that I've been doing here, um, I go with lesson two. And I was talking to Ken about that and he said that's because um, anything above two, you can start to visually see the haze. Um, so he's, he's called it two. Um, if you want to be more critical, then absolutely use your NTU difference of one, if you prefer. And I know downstairs they do it at 0.5. Um, I'd bring that back up to two. And the reason for that is just with the longer term cooling, you will get more haze forming. Um, so yeah, so, so less than two NTU, I'd recommend. Okay, thanks for that, Jackie. We've also got a question here from Andrew Cherry, who's asked which type of bentonite was used in the trial. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, that's a really good point. Um, this was a sodium-calcium mixed bentonite, and I can find out exactly what the brand is and what uh, bentonite was used, but this is the one that we use at the Wick winemaking. So it's a sodium-calcium mix. Okay, thanks. Andrew, if you do need to find out the exact uh, details around that, just uh, send us an email and we'll confirm for you. Um, Stephen Bennett, what is your opinion of the bento test reagent? Is it a useful, reliable method? This is a really good question as well. Um, I personally haven't done a lot of work with a bento test. Uh, Ken Pocock did and his paper is available as well. I can send that through to you if you're interested. But from the bento test, it tended to predict um, more bentonite than the six hour heat test. And that's my understanding of it. So um, it can be a good uh, instant measure, but um, it tended to predict much higher concentrations of bentonite than the six hour heat test for the overnight cooling. So that's my understanding there. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got a question here from Harry Kinsman. Is there an argument to work to a lower delta NTU spec for wine set for aged release, say five years? 
That's a really interesting point. Um, yeah, look, if, if you are ever really worried about um, anything going hazy at all, use a tighter measure, absolutely. So something that's set for um, five years, so say an H semion, for instance, uh, sure, you could work that one t through to a, um, a lower NTU. Um, if, uh, to be honest, with the 0.5, I think that might be a little bit tight. I think the 0.5 has come into play because of um, a 20-minute cooling versus, for instance, in this case, a three-hour cooling. So you really need the time for that reaction, that um, protein aggregation reaction to take place. Um, and again, the longer you leave that, the more haze you're going to get anyway. So this doesn't necessarily mean that in reality you're going to get a, a hazy wine. But I think with the conditions of the heat test, um, I say, if you are concerned about it, I haven't done work up to five years, but if you are concerned about it, you can do a one NTU if that makes you feel more comfortable. Um, but yeah, so we'll have to do some work. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a note of that. We'll have to do some work around what NTU uh, is the best one. So yeah, look, you could work to a one NTU if you prefer. Um, I'd say just from a visual perspective, the two NTU seem to be working quite well. But yeah, look, if you're worried, absolutely go for a one NTU. Okay, thanks for your question there, Harry. Uh, another question here from Stephen. Regarding heating and cooling of the samples, can a microwave be used rather than a water bath? This is a really interesting question. Um, I haven't really thought about it before. I think it's a great question though. I'd say no. I'd say I prefer a uh, water bath because the heating that's produced from a microwave, um, first of all, it's not very consistent because um, you get the microwaves, you get uh, the energy forming, which then translates into heat. Uh, this would not be, I guess, consistent across the sample. Also maintaining it to 80 degrees um, would be really difficult as well. So um, I hear what you're saying to maybe bring that down so you don't need it at um, for two hours, I guess. I'd still um, suggest a two hour water bath just because of not only do you want the proteins to unfold but you also want them to react so you really still still need to have that time for the reaction to take place i love it though i haven't actually worked with that i'm going to you know i'm going to go back to the lab and try a microwave um after this so yeah a really interesting question yep okay a question here from victor nash with the wines that have been held at 17 degrees and at 28 degrees for one year, where four-fifths of those had haze formation, were these wines treated with bentonite? Oh, yes. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, they were the control wines. So I think is if that's referring to the uh, graph that I showed there with both 17 degrees and 28 degrees for the different wine varieties, that was all the control wines. So some of those control wines, even though they were unstable in the heat test, they weren't necessarily throwing a haze under those conditions um, after 12 months. So this is also coming back to, well, if it fails the heat test, what does that mean for the wine? Does that mean that it's going to go hazy within 12 months or, or does it take longer? And under what conditions is that gonna go hazy? It's 28 degrees enough. Maybe it needs to be stored at 35 for, for two months or something. So that's an area that we'd have to look at. But yeah, those wines that I showed were the control wines. Okay, another question here from Marketa and Sarah. Um, what are your thoughts on the version of the heat test heating for one hour at 95 degrees and cooling at four degrees overnight? Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's a really good question um, because this is coming back to some of the variations that we're seeing um, around the world for this heat test. So heating for one hour, at 95, maybe that is enough to unfold all of the proteins as well. And maybe the uh, having that paired with the four degrees overnight cooling, maybe that's enough to throw enough of a haze um, to be, um, yeah, to be considered uh, against the current standards. 
I haven't tried 95 degrees. I was keeping it at 80 degrees and I wanted to bring the cooling time down. So that's why I didn't look at going higher in temperature or um, uh, with the overnight cooling. So certainly it probably is, if, if that's um, being used, for instance, in, in your wine lab, that, that's absolutely fine. And you can just do a comparison even you can just do a comparison yourself if you prefer um, to compare that even at 95 degrees with the three hours cooling uh, just to compare how much haze is produced. I haven't done work at raising the temperature though so um, it might be something that you want to look at but again it comes back to you'll still need that overnight cooling step so you'll still have that really longer term t turnaround time but if that's something that you're, you're interested in then um, yeah worth exploring further. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Another question here from Renee. What other factors apart from the presence of protein have an effect on the presence of haze in wine and how can we recognise and mitigate these results? This is a fantastic question. Uh, I do have a whole other presentation that looks at all of the factors that influence haze. There are a lot. Uh, so when I was looking at this originally, I was just, the idea was that if we understand what forms haze, all we need to do is measure the factors forming haze and then we can really accurately predict it. It's going to be great. Uh, in reality, pretty much everything in wine will influence that haze. Everything. So every time somebody will measure something in wines and compare that to haze, it's going to influence it. So... Uh, the main one, the main factor influencing haze is proteins. So if you have the same wine and you incrementally increase the amount of protein in that wine, you will incrementally increase the amount of haze produced in the heat test. And how much um, that haze is increased by each increment depends very much on that wine. And it will never be the same for two wines. It's very, very frustrating. So um, the other factors include things like uh, the wine pH is a main one that will definitely have an influence on, on haze formation. Looking at things like electrical conductivity, ionic strength. So all, all of the salts that are in wine, metal ions that are in wine will influence it. Um, sulfur dioxide is a new one that's been measured and that influences it. So the amount of sulfur dioxide in your wines um, will increase haze if you have more of it. Uh, what else? Phenolics. Phenolics are a big one as well. Um, more phenolics, you get more haze because of the binding up with different proteins. There's been another paper recently looking at, um, I think it was caffeic acid, that's been found in protein haze. So definitely uh, phenolics, tannins are all involved. Uh, the only thing uh, that's not necessarily involved is polysaccharides. Seems to be, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it's mitigating it, maybe it isn't. Uh, so it, 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 there's a really, there's a lot going on. So um, unfortunately, mitigating it is still the best thing is to add bentonite. <laughs> and we're working on some bentonite alternatives at the moment. But yeah, a, a lot of work done around there. Okay, thanks for your question, Renee. Uh, Nick has asked, have you had any experience with UF bentonites? And is there a risk that they will only remove particular sized protein molecules? Interesting. I haven't actually used UF bentonites at all. Um, with, the, with the way the bentonite works, it's generally considered a cation exchange. So um, the bentonite is a clay, it has pores in it, and positively charged ions go into those pores uh, because clays generally tend to be negative. Well, they are. They're neg negatively charged. So when they get into wine, they'll release, for instance, either the sodium or calcium that's inside those pores and they will attract protein into them as well because the proteins at wine pH are um, positively charged. So I, I think um, it's a really interesting question. I'd have to know the pore size of this, but I think because bentonite is uh, carrying a negative uh, charge anyway, then um, you will still be removing those proteins. So it doesn't necessarily have to go into the pores, perhaps it can just absorb onto the surface um, on the outside. It shouldn't be size related. I'd say it'd be more to do with the amount of charge on the proteins. So you'd be pulling out and anything that's more positively charged will be pulled out first. Uh, so I think it's more to do with that, but I haven't had um, direct experience with that though. 
Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, Leisha's got a question here. Have you ever experienced results that show a decrease in NTU with the increased addition of bentonite and then the results start to fail at really high rates? I've only seen this a few times, but it has bewildered me. Any ideas, i.e. they are passing at say one, one gram per litre and one gram per litre add, but then show fails at 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, etc. Yeah, uh, this is one of the things I keep hearing as well, that that can happen. Uh, if this is a white wine, I'd say maybe it comes back to the slurry of bentonite used or, um, yeah, the, the number of proteins or the amount of protein in each of the samples potentially comes back to that. Uh, could come back to filtering, for instance. Maybe maybe something is seeded more haze than, than otherwise would have, for instance. Uh, because of this, there's so many factors that are going to influence this haze, then, uh, yeah, it, it could be a lot of different things. Uh, for rosé, I've heard this happens quite a bit with rosé, and I haven't had a lot of experience with rosé, which is why I want to explore this further. And in that case, I would argue that something like tannin, um, from or, or anthocyanins from the the rose color maybe that's interacting with protein because that's what they tend to do really really well and that can be contributing to it by um competitive binding but um i'd say it's one of those things because the interactions are so complex that i think it just doesn't take much to tip it over the edge uh but in this case um it could be the one gram per liter is enough and anything beyond that is starting to induce a haze where otherwise it wouldn't. And maybe it comes back to this uh, seeding effect. But yeah, great question. Short answer, really can't say for sure. But it's just a complex process, yeah. Okay, so we've got a few more questions here. One from Alyssa. Um, we only have a dry block heater available for use in our lab. How does this affect bentonite finding trial results? Yeah, this is often the case as well that I've heard that people will have a block heater instead or, or some sort of um, uh, water on a, a stirrer plate as well, a heating plate. Uh, so if the, as long as the, all of the liquid is um, covered in the heating block, and I'm not sure about the size of the holes in your heating block or, or the size of your tubes, but make sure the, all of the liquid that's, that's there um, in your sample is within the, the heater block. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing. So as long as that's the case, I mean, really, you just need to get it up to temperature and make sure it maintains temperature. The issue with the heater block is that it, you can have half the liquid um, on the top or not within the heater block. That can be an issue. Uh, but as long as it's all there and it's um, within the heating block itself, so um, within the holes of the heating block, depending on the size of what you got. As long as all the liquid's covered, it's fine. It should be okay. You just got to maintain it at 80 degrees and that's absolutely fine. Okay, thanks for your question, Melissa. Um, another question here. After heating for two hours at 80 degrees to work out the bentonite additions, were the wines then tested for heat stability under the same conditions to confirm stability or were they tested using the 2006 method without doing this, aren't we comparing apples with oranges? Um, okay, the bentonite additions, uh, sorry, I'm just reading through this question again. So the same conditions, okay. Um, so the two hours of heating at um, 80 degrees, we then did the bentonite addition, so bentonite fining for all of the heat, uh, all of the cooling conditions. So we did work it out for all of them. So that's how we got that it works out to be the same result because we were doing the, um, the cooling, the bentonite fining trials for all the different cooling rates. So we were definitely um, checking all of that and they all just kept consistently coming back to the same dose rate so we were doing this by doing a snapshot first for instance so we'd have um, 0 0.5 1 and 1 1.5 for instance then work out where that um, 
which one was producing a stable wine and then we narrow it down further. So then we start doing 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 for instance. If, if, well, if, if it's below 0 0.5, then we do the 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 result. So um, very much doing it under the same conditions, repeating it a lot, which is why I'm sure Victor had a really fun time when he was here. But um, definitely, definitely to work out what effect that really is having on the bench night finding. So um, yeah, I hope I hope that answers your question. Okay, we've also got a follow up here from Alicia. Um, Thanks, Jackie. In response to your query, yes, the problematic wines have been rosé and also Viognier, extensive skin contact. Did you want to make any further comments yeah. around that? Okay, just hold on, Jackie. Yeah, um, thanks, Alicia. That um, would confirm my hypothesis or not confirm it, but it supports the hypothesis that it's probably tannin, particularly anything with extensive skin contact, even a Viognier. Uh, definitely you're going to get more phenolics in that. That's going to be competing with bentonite for the proteins and that's where you start going to get a lot of weirdness. So um, yeah, so thanks for reporting back on that. That's great. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. That was our final question by the looks. Um, some food for thought there, I'm sure, for Jackie. Thanks for all your questions, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'd really like to thank Jackie for providing an interesting, interesting and comprehensive update surrounding her research uh, on these trials. I'd um, also like to thank you, the audience, for participating in today's session. Um, for all attendees, you'll receive a follow-up email um, with a link to this recording and also a link to a survey. The next AWRI webinar is on the 31st of August with Wine Australia's Mark Rowley providing insights into global supply and demand trends with regard to Australian wine. Uh, if you'd like to register for this session, please visit the AWRI website. Okay, that's all we have for today. Um, thank you again for attending and I look forward to seeing you again at the next AWRI webinar.